um, so this is Alan Stotts. Um, <clears throat> it truly is one of those situations of uh, someone who needs no introduction in some ways for us. Um, this, uh, we realizing that Dr. Stevens was um, uh, reaching the end of his uh, formal ways of giving us his wisdom and knowledge, which uh, for me largely consisted of walking down the hall and sticking my head in his office. Um, we asked him to give a um, talk to us on and left the topic relatively open and and uh, and he said and asked us the format and Andy and I said you know we we'd like for you to choose um, and so uh, he's going to give us a <clears throat> retrospective look back at his um, career and some of the lessons that he's learned and I think it'll be something that fortunately we're recording uh, that we'll all be able to go back in and, um, and look at. Um, Dr. Stevens, thank you for being with us this morning. We um, <clears throat> hope that we're interrupting uh, your usual morning sleep, which you... <laughs> <laughs> no problem, I have my coffee here. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, so we'll get started. Um, I thought I'd reflect upon the uh, fascinating and ever-changing landscape of orthopedics at the end of my career and prepare some of you for the future. And so, hang on. So uh, annually, Utah celebrates the arrival of Brigham Young and the Pioneers through the days of 47, coming down Immigration Canyon. There was no city here at the time. If you fast forward 100 years, 1957, Dr. Coleman returned to Utah and founded the academic program that we so much uh, enjoy. I was 10 years old at that time, didn't know I'd be going into orthopedics. And on the left, you see the institutions where I trained and a little timeline arriving in 1973 for internship and then residency. Doctors Coleman and Dunn were my mentors and remain so throughout my career. I did a fellowship in Melbourne, Australia in children's orthopedics when fellowships were just barely coming onto the scene and was in private practice for 10 years with teaching affiliation, during which time the first orthopedic fellowship in pediatrics was established at the University of Utah and then continued at the University of Utah uh, after formalizing our, our relationship in 1990. And you can see the buildings have all changed and continue to change. So what else changed? Well, you know, you can have low tech or high tech. A lot of things have changed. Hopefully we stick to the principles in orthopedics and then apply those changes as needed. And pretty much everything has changed. That's why there's so many blanks in the column on the left. Leading up to subspecialization with fellowships, which most of you will be involved in. The residency had changed. We were pretty homogenous back then, uh, as you can see. And we have attained a gender balance and we're working on more heterogeneity in general and have established a fellowship. So I dare say the, uh, the trainees are better looking and smarter than they were back in the 70s. This is the operating room at Shriners Hospital where I was introduced to the nuances and challenges of pediatric orthopedics by the Grand Master, Dr. Coleman, who would say at the scrub sink and elsewhere, are we making any, or would ask, are we making any progress? and I believe we are. And so pediatric orthopedics for me has uh, been very interesting and challenging with a lot of anticipation and sometimes cunning required to accomplish the goals. Surgical chairs have changed. Mine is depicted on, on the left here, which I now have at home. And so that's evolved too, but they all serve the same purpose. So fracture treatment in pediatrics has changed. This is a couple of examples, superchondral humerus fractures. We used to put in traction for 10 days and then in a cast. So they were in the hospital for 10 days and femoral shaft was the same. And that's yielded to a closed or open reduction with image intensifier, percutaneous pinning, et cetera. So that's changed. Skiffy has changed. We had multiple nulls pins in situ. And then later on, either uh, possibly hip fusion or intertrochosteotomy and after a while, total hips became available. And that's changed to cannulated percutaneous screws with uh, hip salvage via open reduction and or FAI treatment. Clubfoot treatment changed radically in a fairly short time. 
in Utah. Uh, it had been around in Iowa with Dr. Ponsetti forever, but the real changes occurred in the 1990s. And who would have guessed that the posterior media release shown at the top would have a free fall and be replaced by the Ponsetti method. For limb length inequality and uh, sometimes for angular change, the Femister technique was employed. Dr. Coleman had trained with Femister and we did these in the 70s, which was an open procedure with plain films and uh, in his hands was pretty slick, but it had a narrow age range and, because it was permanent. So you needed perfect timing, which we didn't have. Dr. Blount had introduced staples uh, in the 1940s and they had uh, popularity that waxed and waned, but the contraindications were that never do it in children under 10 and don't do it in children with sick physis, such as dysplasias or metabolic disease because of the fear of permanent physial closure. But this was the conventional wisdom and sometimes you need to look the other way. So here's a child I saw at age three and a half this is not physiologic, this is progressive genu valgum. He was developing patellar instability. And I couldn't get myself to do osteotomies. And I had a recent experience at that time with a different patient with migrated staple. So I didn't know if I trusted that. So I took a leap of faith and applied one third tubular plates. And nine months later, he was straight and the plates were removed. And I dare say this was the world's first tension band plate employment. Later in my practice, a child with Schmidt dysplasia, shown here at 11 months, who simulated standing film. And at the hips, they have basically a stress fracture. It's like a Salter II fracture with a slip of the chondroepiphysis, which causes fatigue and limping. And you can't wait till the perfect time and do osteotomies on these patients. So by then, I had uh, come up with the refinement of the tension band plates as shown here, and commencing at age 19 months. I applied plates at three levels and uh, 12 months later, she was straight and, uh, and happy. And here she is a bit later. I took out the plates at the knees, maintained the ones at the hips. The proximal femora are stabilized, the fractures healed, the symptoms resolve. Now her father had been treated by me with all these things shown here, hospitalizations, spica, cast, wheelchairs, crutches, et cetera, removing a good chunk of uh, his childhood enjoyment. And he still has a smiling face and brought his daughter to see me. So I give him credit for that. She, and shown here over the course of 13 years, had five same day surgeries with none of the items shown above. And I've had multiple second generation patients. I have a couple of third generation patients, but I couldn't find them for this presentation. This may range from idiopathic genuvalgum, metabolic bone disease, or skeletal dysplasias. So in my practice, osteotomy has been supplanted by guided growth whenever the physes are open, which is a wide age range in children, ranging from as young as 19 months to 18 years if the growth plates are open. So what about the natural history of torsion? When I started training, the prevailing sentiment was to use straight lash shoes and Thomas heels or twister cables if it's more severe. In the 80s, this yielded to Dr. Staley's um, teachings that uh, benign neglect would suffice because torsion, when, if left alone, will spontaneously improve. And I admit it often does, but not always. So here, for example, is a child I saw for tibial torsion reading her mother's iPad. And her mother had two patellar uh, tibial tubercle transfers and had significant ongoing knee problems and nobody had ever done a torsional exam. And so I submit that her tibial torsion set her up for her knee problems, which are unresolved because the torsion persisted. So for the daughter, I suggested when she's slightly older that if it persisted, rotational osteotomies would be the first maneuver. So uh, what about patellar instability in these patients? You can't rely on non-operative measures shown above, therapy, taping, neuromuscular training, sports restriction. You should all, regardless of your subspecialty, screen for malalignment preferably a prone torsional profile, look for valgus antiversion and outward tibial torsion. And if you find these things, treat the angle with uh, guided growth or the rotation with osteotomies. As I tell the residents, the patella is an end organ. You can address that later. So here's a girl on the field who's had patellar instability ongoing with well-meaning, albeit different uh, 
supports here with ongoing symptoms. And this will not resolve. Her career will be short-lived. So in the age of specialization, it's kind of like Pangea as we drift apart. We, some, we overlap, obviously, for the anatomy and the pathophysiology, but we sometimes don't communicate or examine the patients the same way and have different thought processes. For example, in this uh, journal here, the sports people might be thinking of the soft tissue injuries about the knee that occurred with this type of trauma, thinking, as I would say, inside the box. And indeed, they do occur. The joint surgeons might be thinking about, well, eventually they're going to need a patellofemoral or a total knee or uni replacement, again, inside the box. In pediatrics, we think outside the box. I think about not only about alignment, including femoral anaversion or tibial torsion as shown here, leading to these problems. So an algorithm in the sports journals, in the past anyway, has been arthroscopy, tubercle transfer, et cetera, but there's no discussion of osteotomies and alignment in the older literature. And as Dr. Coleman used to say, it's hard to think of the diagnosis if you don't, hard to make the diagnosis if you don't think of it. So here's my timeline. Uh, when I started training, we did open patellar realignments, proximal and distal, very extensive procedure, often bilateral staged. This yielded to arthroscopic lateral release, which proved disappointing, and I think in part, because of not appreciating malalignment. And then a wave of tubercle transfers and now uh, in, including a, an extended run is the MPFL repair, which I acknowledge is good in the right patients, but not for everybody. And I think, you know, we need to consider limb realignment in the holistic picture. The risk of failed knee surgery is proportional to the degree of torsion. So if you have 20 degrees or more of excessive femoral torsion or tibial, or combined both, then you may need to consider osteotomies if you want long range success. So persistent torsion matters. This is not Photoshopped. This is a patient who had femoral retroversion and outward tibial torsion who obviously was not engaged in sports. And sequentially, I untwisted his tibias and then his femora. We did a movement analysis study on a number of patients at Shriners Hospital using drop landing uh, before and after rotational osteotomies as depicted here. And with Dr. McWilliams' help, uh, documented the markedly improved kinematics at all levels in the lower extremity, thus justifying this type of surgery. And this was published in uh, Gait and Posture. And along the way, this is my largest patient, Bart the Bear, who weighed 680 kilograms. His life-size picture is in our x-ray suite at primary. And uh, he had a synovial sarcoma that I was recruited to remove. They didn't have a tourniquet, so I used a Penrose drain. Um, anyway, things went well. This is my smallest patient, which is a little baby bunny. And we compared tension band plating to staples. This was with uh, Jeff Mast when he was a resident. This is the most unusual case. And Dr. Stotz uh, and I were the orthopedic team involved here. And at midnight, they were finally separated. And then the reconstruction phase began. This is my medical bag. I've, I've donated the GANS periacetabular osteotomy tools to my partners, but I took the bag home. And parenthetically, this is my great-great-grandfather's medical toolkit with orthopedic saws and so on. So maybe I inherited some of my interest in the field. And I don't have a right of rescission. Primary took the precaution of, of locking down room four so I wouldn't come back and change my mind. So what will I do now? with uh, old age actually already here. Of course, I'll spend more time with the family, et cetera, but you know, opportunity abounds on the internet. I, I, there's career opportunities. This popped up on my computer just the other day, or maybe I'll join social media and become an influencer or return to Africa and other countries, which I will and do outreach teaching and surgery when travel is safe and continue with some research. Uh, the physis, in my opinion, is the last frontier, at least in pediatric orthopedics. We have relied upon medical imaging, albeit sophisticated with uh, uh, MRIs and so on, but this is all indirect evidence about what's going on inside that box right there, the physis. As I mentioned to the parents, the bones don't grow, the physis grows, the cartilage grows, and then bone replaces it. So wouldn't it be nice to do a physeal biopsy 
uh, if it were safe to study these skeletal and diagnose the skeletal dysplasias. There are 450 defined variants in monitor metabolic bone disease before and during treatment. So we've done this in the um, Bone and Joint Research Lab at the VA, first on a rabbit uh, model, and this was subsequently published, where we did biopsies and uh, ascertained that there was no growth disturbance, that it was well tolerated, even in such a tiny patient. And then extrapolated that, or, or succeeded that with the study in sheep. And again, proved that the biopsy is benign. After all, our sports colleagues sometimes drill holes across the physes of eight millimeters to do ACL repairs. And uh, some proponents of the so-called metazole procedure put large screws across the physis. So we knowingly violate the physis for surgical reconstruction. We could do it safely for diagnostic purposes. So there's always painting. And uh, maybe I'll follow in the footsteps of uh, Mr. Moss there and spend more time painting. So for the residents and fellows, so what can change by 2069? And I think now you know the answer. The answer is everything. The buildings will change, the techniques will change. The pathophysiology will be better understood. Um, and I hope you'll hang in there and watch all these cool changes and adapt to them. Because you as residents and fellows, <clears throat> can retain empathy, personal integrity, critical thinking, and scientific curiosity, which are the very qualities that landed you in this training program. And these will sustain you over the years, as long as you stay interested. So in conclusion, you are the future mentors. Everything will change, so be ready. Be open-minded and receptive, and continue with lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevens. We have a couple of minutes here for anybody that has any comments or questions. I know there are several um, colleagues and outside observers here. We have um, about 10 minutes before we need to get started. Perry Schoenecker in St. Louis has been a privilege to be an associate and a friend of Peter over these many decades. He's been a critical thinker, an outstanding surgeon, and I've learned and still learn from him and uh, we wish he stays with us very, very connected as we've kept him connected with a lot of Zoom conferences every month to South America. So Peter, thank you for everything you do and continue to do for us. It's been a pleasure to be your associate and your friend. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. And I recall the first talk I gave on stapling in the eighties was at your Shriners Hospital in St. Louis. And I, I went quite a bit over time. So I was determined not to do that again. <laughs> and of course, now I don't staple anymore. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. This is an amazing talk for an amazing guy with an amazing career, actually. And it's really fun to see it all put together uh, as you've done. Um, how do you step out of norms comfortably to create what's new? and be confident enough when you're having challenges to identify those challenges and fix those rather than move back to the norm? Well, that's an excellent question. And so, you know, I thought about giving a, a talk about mentors, which I unwittingly became. Um, mentoring goes in both directions, and but you have to believe and follow your mentors up to a point, but then, you have to keep asking why, either ask them or ask yourself, you know, why can't you staple under age 10? Well, the obvious reason is, well, the prices might close. And my thought to myself is, well, it might not. And so I gradually stapled at nine, eight, seven, got down to four, like the picture I showed you, and, and you could only use one staple and it would, you know, it could loosen or bend. And I realized that the bending staples was actually uh, <clears throat> paradoxically a failing implant in a succeeding procedure. The trouble is they weren't made to bend. So I decided, well, we need a flexible tether. So that particular item is where I probably veered the most off course. But um, uh, on the flip side for club feet, I used to do poster meter releases once or twice a week until uh, this Dr. Stotts who had been a fellow with me and I taught him how to do it right. 
switched and started doing Ponseti treatment. And I thought, well, uh, I'm, I wasn't offended by it. I was puzzled by it. So I went to Iowa and had the epiphany and stopped doing post termeter release. So you have to be open and receptive wh wherever the idea comes from, yeah, whether it's a, a mentor or a resident or a medical student. Um, you have to question dogma. And if they say, don't overdo this, I know you don't like your kids to ask you, but you say to yourself, why and what if? And, and it's getting harder to do, I agree. Like with IRB, it would be hard to um, report these things in the way that we're expected to do now. Um, I, I could go on and on, I could give a whole hour of talk <laughs> about how everything's challenging and changed. But what makes it interesting is your willingness. To, oh, and then the other thing is you just learn from your own disappointing results. For example, in Perthes, I did the intertrochan pterocostiotomy for containment, which is still the mantra for more than 20 years, and I believe I did it well until uh, at various times, those patients didn't do well. Either 10 years later, they weren't doing well, or soon after an osteotomy, they weren't doing well. And so I, I disciplined myself not to do those osteotomies anymore and to do something different, which time didn't permit me to delve into. Um, so, you know, scrutinize your own results, reporting or not, and be willing to, to change from what you were taught and what you teach others, um, be willing to reassess and adjust yourself in your practice. And I, I do give these parents credit because they came back to see me after I put them through all those things. You know, they don't have to do it anymore. That was a rambling answer. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Stevens, there's a question in the chat from Lucas Anderson about the pushback that you've received from the orthopedic community and innovation and how have you pushed through that? Well, when I was a surgical intern in Utah, internship and residency weren't linked. And I was supposed to go back to Boston and trained. Uh, and I called them and I got to meet Dr. Coleman and Dunn and had an offer here. And I called them and said, I'm going to stay in Utah. And frankly, it's sort of like making the orthopedic desert bloom. I think had I gone to Boston, I, there would have been a lot more ingrained tradition and scrutiny where I could not have done some of the things I could do in the desert and then present gradually <laughs> to the world. So I'm partly a product of, of my environment. Um, I don't know what else to say about that. The other comment I'll, encouragement I'll make is for those of you who can to go and do medical outreach work overseas because they don't have the tools we have. They have instruments and CRMs and things that are donated that are sometimes outdated and not working. So you have to improvise. And so you come home and be willing to improvise in your own practice. For example, in Tanzania, patients had to ride a bus 18 hours from up, up country to come to clinic. Well, you can't put in eight plates and say, come back every three months and we'll take an x-ray. So instead, because they all have cell phones, I said, send a picture once a month and we'll tell you when to come back. It could be three months, it could be 15 months, but that involves them in using a technology they understand. And then I brought it home and use it in Utah to totally streamline my clinics. And, uh, you know, so, so go overseas and, and see what they don't have and improvise and then come back and, and make changes here. Well, I, I, um, I hope you have a chance to read through the chat um, at all the people that are thanking you for all that you've taught us and your impact on all of us um, and the generations of orthopedists that are coming behind you. And thank you very much. Yeah, I'll do that. I have plenty of time to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you.